So my talk's um, discussing a project that we're working on that's an empirical investigation of the impact of different methods for synthesizing evidence in a network meta-analysis. The team consists of Simon Turner, Joe McKenzie, Peter Herbison, George Slanty, Ian White, R.G. Veroniki, and Adriani Nicolacopoulou. And funding for the project was provided by the Health Research Council of New Zealand. And I should also say that our protocol for this project has just been accepted into the Systematic Reviews Journal. So network meta-analyses are obviously increasing in popularity, and as Ian has just talked about, there are a couple of different methods to analyze these networks. And as far as we're concerned, or as far as we know, to date, there's no empirical study that's compared the results of network meta-analyses using these contrast-based and ARM-based methods. And no one empirically has looked to see how different priors for the between trial heterogeneity variants in the contrast-based models would, could affect the results. So that was the aim of our study, and we're also planning on looking at how characteristics of the networks might affect these results, but those results aren't actually going to be presented here. So we had available to us a network, or a database of networks, that was collated by George Salanti's group and published last year in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. And so we used a subset of those networks, and it, actually in keeping with what Ian has done, we're looking at networks that have a primary outcome that's binary, there was no evidence of inconsistency in the networks, and we needed the outcome data available. So for each treatment arm, we needed both the number of events and the number of participants. So this database had 456 networks. We excluded 272 because either the outcome data was missing or it was the primary outcome wasn't binary. And an additional 26 were excluded because either there was some missing data or it appeared as if um, there was inconsistency in the network. So this left us with 158 networks for our analysis. So our plan was to use R to look at several different methods. This table gives you quite a bit of detail about each of the methods, and I'll point out the kind of key differences that we should focus on. The first three methods are titled contrast synthesis, and these are what Ian referred to as contrast-based likelihood methods. The first two in particular are contrast synthesis models in a Bayesian framework. So the main difference here is that in the first model, we use an uninformative or uniform prior to estimate the between trial heterogeneity variance. Whereas in the second model, we use the, what we've called an informative prior, and these informative priors have come from Turner's paper. So Ian also mentioned this earlier. And what, Ian, what Turner and Al did was look at 15, about 15,000 meta-analyses from Cochrane systematic reviews and put together predictive distribution, distributions for between trial heterogeneity variants based on the treatment comparisons and outcomes. Our third, our third model, our third contrast synthesis model, is in the Frequentist framework. So in this model, we don't need to worry about the prior distributions. And the final model, which we've called ARM synthesis model, is this ARM-based likelihood model, um, where we have, we've assumed homogeneity of the variances of the random effects, and we've also assumed that the off-diagonal of that correlation matrix, the elements are all equal. We are planning on fitting a fifth arm, a fifth model and a second arm synthesis model, but we don't have that running just yet, so that's why it's grayed out in the slide. So as I said, all the analyses, actually going back to here, all the analyses have been done in R, but our data preparation and graphing have actually been done in Stata. And for the Bayesian methods, we've used three chains with a burden of 300,000 followed by 300,000 samples, which have been saved at an interval of 10 from each of the three chains. So the preliminary results that I'm going to show you, they're graphical displays where we've compared the estimates 
of three parameters between the four models. So we've looked at the log of the odds ratios, the standard error of the log of the odds ratios, and the ranks, which we've derived from super values. So these are what the 158 network networks look like. You can see that some of them have many treatments with many comparisons, and others have few treatments with few comparisons. So we had 158 networks available. After running the four models, there were seven networks that just wouldn't run. They just wouldn't give us any results, so we obviously couldn't include those. Another 31 networks failed to converge. And so by this, we looked at convergence diagnostics for the Bayesian methods. Those included assessment of the trace plots, the posterior kernel density plots, the Brooks-Gelman diagnostic plot, and the shrink factors. And if two of those diagnostics appeared to show lack of convergence, we assumed that the network didn't converge. So there was 31 networks that failed to converge, so we were left with 120 networks that we could look at. So initially I was interested, or we were interested in looking at how much time it took for these different methods to run. So the times are both given in minutes and measured in minutes. So where you see zero, it's actually just saying it's less than a minute because I don't have seconds. So the frequentist or contrast synthesis model three, all of the networks ran in less than a minute. The two contrast synthesis models one and two are the contrast-based likelihood models. They took a median of about four to four and a half minutes, and the most complicated network, or the one with the most treatments, took about 20 minutes to run. The ARM synthesis model, that took a median of about 37 minutes, and the longest or largest network took about 20 hour, 21 hours to run. Now we'll go, some of the, go through some of the prelim results. First, looking at the log odds ratios, we have here the Bland-Altman plots comparing each of the models. So on the y-axis, we have the difference in the log odds ratios, and on the x-axis, we have the average of the log odds ratios. And where you see good agreement, you'll see that the dots, which actually represent about 3,500 pairwise comparisons from 120 networks, is should lie close to that uh, red line, that zero line. The black line shows the line of agreement, and the black dashed lines show the 95% regression limits of agreement. So when we have good comparison, the black line should be parallel and close to zero. And you can see this when if you look at the contrast synthesis models one compared to contrast synthesis model two, you see very good agreement between those two models. And if we compare contrast synthesis model three, that frequentist model, to the two contrast synthesis models, again, we see quite good agreement. Whereas when we look at the ARM synthesis model and compare it to the contrast synthesis models one, two, or three, we see poor agreement and the difference in the log odds ratio starts to become a bit more variable. Now I've put up the bottom part of this figure, which shows the standard errors of the log odds ratio. So again, we're looking at bland altman plots. When we compare contrast synthesis models one and two, we see that as the average standard error increases, the difference increases. And in this case, it's telling you that contrast synthesis model one has larger standard errors than model two. We see similar patterns with contrast synthesis model three, and again with ARM synthesis model one compared to those contrast synthesis models, we see that there's quite a bit of variability in the standard errors. If we look at the three points that I've just highlighted in blue, these stood out to me as somewhat outliers in these bland Altman plots. These three points actually come from one single network, so this is a network of eight treatments, one placebo treatment and seven non-placebo treatments. And it's of 18 studies looking at oral corticosteroid sparing for the um, elimination of chronic asthma. So this network would be called considered a star network. And what we can do is we can look at the 
effect estimate of the log odds ratio for each of the models comparing, say, treatment one to two. So that's what you see now. And you'll see the red line is the effect estimate with its 95% confidence interval for the ARM synthesis model. The green estimate is for the contrast synthesis model three, or that Quintus model. And the blue lines are for the two Bayesian models. That red vertical line that looks a bit astray is represents the log odds ratio of zero or no association. What we can also do is then look at all of the direct and indirect comparisons. So here we have the estimates for treatment one compared to two and treatment one compared to three and so on. Those three points that I highlighted in the Bland Altman plot actually correspond to the comparisons of treatment one to seven, treatment four to seven, and treatment five to seven. And we can see that treatment one to seven is a direct comparison. There were two studies. In treatment one, there were only two events from 81 participants, and from treatment seven, there were 61 events from 172 participants, whereas the comparisons of treatment four to seven and treatment five to seven were actually indirect comparisons. And so in these three highlighted plots, we see that the ARM synthesis model gives estimates that are closer to the null value with tighter confidence intervals. So we can also look at the ranks and the super values. So starting with the ranks, this plot shows the agreement in the rankings between the two models. So the bars in the diagonal show the proportion of times the first and the second method yield the same result. Green bars show good agreement which is what we see when we look at contrast synthesis model one and two, and in fact, we see perfect agreement there. Again, if you look at contrast synthesis model three or that frequentist model and compare it to contrast models one and two, again, you see quite good agreement. Where we see poor agreement, we'll start seeing more spread in the bars and more uh, yellow and brown and orange colors. And so this happens if we look at the ARM synthesis models compared to the contrast synthesis models. So if you look at this, you'll notice that rank number one is generally the same between the ARM synthesis models and the contrast synthesis models, but the rest of the ranks start to show differences. So these ranks were derived using the sucre values, so we also created these bland Altman plots based on the sucre values, and these tell a very similar story to what the rank plots show. So you have quite good agreement in the ranks between the contrast synthesis models with more variability when you look at the ARM synthesis models. So we've seen from our prelim results that there's good agreement between the contrast synthesis met methods in terms of both the estimates and the treatment ranks. There appear to be differences when we start looking at the ARM synthesis model. The contrast synthesis models tend to have larger standard errors and more variability with respect to these standard errors when we start looking at the ARM synthesis models in comparison. We are planning on fitting another ARM synthesis model, but have had some issues in getting that running. And we are also planning on looking at multi-level models to estimate the differences between these methods and explore the factors that might explain the differences. <laughs>